to your intermediate speed. Uh, who else? Is, is anyone else from different classes? Yeah? Where are you Novice guys from? C. Intermediate C? Novice. Novice C and? Intermediate uh, C. Intermediate C. Uh, who are your teachers? Andrew. Andrew and? Luke. 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 Rough gig, my friend. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. I reckon education debates are quite easy to understand. I think they can be a really like common area. There's usually around at Worlds every year that is centred on education or centred on children of some kind. And I think that shows that there's still a lot of complexity you can go into, but it is not one of those debates that you're going to be like priced out of, if that makes sense. Like you're not going to get anybody there in your room that's like, hello, I wrote my PhD on the thing, uh, on um, North Korean politics and I'm going to win this motion just by my sheer amount of facts or whatever. That doesn't really tend to happen with education as much. It is more about your complexity of analysis and how you break down and characterize stakeholders. So that's mainly going to be what I focus on this session. Oh, sorry. I used this PowerPoint for my other kids and we had a joke, but yeah. Okay, cool. So I think it's important to take, to break down the types of schools we're talking about. So do you know what I mean when I say private schools? What are private schools? Not organized by government. Sorry? Schools that are not organized by government. Not organized by government. Typically, how do children attend those schools? Pay to go. So, that means that whilst there might be a spectrum, you usually have to be fairly wealthy to attend. Normally there's a degree of prestige attached to it, and it means that like, often they are funded very, very well, you have very wealthy people going. So particularly in Australia, the top schools in Australia are private schools, same in America. England's a bit different in that they call it private schools public schools, so it's very confusing. But if you they talk about public school boys in England, they're not like, oh no, they went to some sad government school with no resources. That's like the kids who go to Yale and Oxford. So don't be, yeah, so don't be confused about that. That's only really to be conscious if you're talking about stuff in the UK. But typically, bar the UK, what are public schools? Schools owned by the government. Excellent. And who tends to go? How do you attend these schools? You live near it. So one thing is it's dependent on the area. So that means that they can be quite flexible. So if you are in a very wealthy area, your public school is likely to be far better than a public school in a rural area, for example. So I think that is important when you're talking about these public schools, that they're going to be a, a huge discrepancy as to what they actually look like and what they do. Um, obviously, selective schools imply some kind of entrance exam, so you've got very streamed classes, that sort of thing. I think homeschooling is a really big area of debate. Often comes up at Worlds as a type of motion like banning some typical group of accessing it or doing that sort of thing. I think rural schools have their own set of problems. Same with wealthy schools. And by specialist schools, I mean stuff like you know sports colleges, uh, school, the schools just um, for the arts, things like that. I think there is a um, I haven't got it on here, maybe I'm going to put it on later, but religious schools and schools centred around minority groups are particularly important. So um, for the intermediate guys who watched our demo debate on schools for the LGBT community, so that exists. That's a, there's a school in America called the Harvey Milk um, School that was founded for the purpose of giving those kids a safe haven. So those schools definitely exist. And also I think, um, yeah, like religious schools tend to take up a big portion of debate. So that means when you get a motion that is talking about any aspect of education, you automatically kind of have an extension because they probably can't touch all the different types of schools and how they're affected. So that can be a really useful way if you're stuck for material just to sit down and think, well, if, you, if I'm at a private school, am I going to be affected by a change in curriculum? Am I going to be affected by a change in the way that the government decides to fund things? Or am I not going to be affected at all because I have a, like a bank of cash, for example, or that sort of thing? Excellent. Oh, that, that's not four. That's, that's just three, but it's four. I think there's four common areas of debate. Debate centered on curriculum, debate centered on specialist schools, stuff on university, and I think the incentives are a bit different in university, and obviously your actors are very different in university because they're not children, and so you can't run arguments about parental choice and things like that. Um, and lastly, on children and family. But before I move on to that, what I wanted to do was talk through some common principled arguments that happen in debate. Uh, is there a way I can, maybe I can just turn that off and then it goes back up. Before we jump into specific topics. So I think one of the, or like at the core of education debate is just what is school about? Why do we have it? And what purpose should it seek to serve? So. 
Why do we have schools? To learn. To educate. To educate. About what? Knowledge and social skills. Cool. So we kind of have a split here. We've got probably stuff like life skills. The idea that you need to be able to talk in front of an audience. Maybe that includes softer skills like knowing how to socialise and things like that. But also things like maybe some say you probably need to be a functioning adult. Yeah, you've got to know how to cook and pay a bill and do all those things that you need to do to live in society and have a general awareness and general knowledge. And then there is obviously the other split of academics where you have to be maybe the purpose of school is to get good grades so that you can get into university and do that sort of thing. Why else? Moral value. Sorry? Moral value. Moral value. Excellent. I'm going to call this, uh, I might make that a separate thing. Personal development. So obviously that is tied to what you learn, but school is probably supposed to instruct you on values to a certain extent. You would say that it is useful probably for the state to make good people so that they don't do bad things. And that also, and it's probably useful to be a well-rounded person that is good at many things or able to talk to different types of people, is integrated into society. So often you'll get debates about, for example, compulsory religious education in public schools or like um, in government schools, and that can be one of the things you look at. Is the role of the school to integrate you into society, or is it to purely focus on academics, or is it to do, for example, or is it to be secular and promote those kinds of values? And often there is a clash on like, what values should we teach our children? That is very common in curriculum debates. Why else does school exist? Who runs schools? Who sets the curriculum? Government. Government. So I reckon it's to do with what the state wants as well. So one of the motions they w um, Andrew wanted to set at the tournament was, uh, we didn't like it, so we said no, because I'm VA, so I just said no, <coughs> was that the state should prioritise, um, in history curriculums, they should prioritise um, instances of state failure rather than state triumph. Or a very common one as well is that we should teach colonialism in a um, black and white way, that it is unabashedly bad, and that the British did horrible things and can do genocide without showing a balanced perspective, for example, or saying, or like, you're just painting that sort of thing to be bad. So often there is a question on like the state's values and how they want to teach their children. So maybe that is to be a more cohesive member of society, or maybe we should teach them to question the state and to question what they learn from the government. Does that make sense? So often you will run a principled argument about what we think the purpose of school is and why we think that we fulfill that purpose of school or not. So, for example, does anybody know how to structure a principled argument? Have we talked about that? Very easy. So, oh, firstly, what is a principled argument? Have you learned about principled and practical arguments? Yeah, what's a practical argument? Yeah, something happens. And what's the principled argument? Why should we do something? Why we should do something, kind of. So I think the best way to demonstrate it is, what's your name, sorry? Jane. Jane. So if I take Jane's pencil case, this is really good for me practically because I get this thick new pencil case with all these pens. And I can maybe sell them. I can, I've got stationery now. I don't have to ask, like, I don't have to ask Chris to give me another, like, pen or whatever because I keep losing it. But I probably shouldn't do that because stealing is wrong. So the practical benefit is that I get a pencil case. The principal harm is that stealing is wrong. So often principal arguments are dealing with values and how things morally should be as opposed to practically should happen. Does that make sense? So step one is to name your principal. So you would have learned about things like bodily autonomy, I imagine, and liberty and freedom of speech. Those are all principles. So your principle might be in this, um, if we have the debate that we should, let's, let's do a really easy debate and then we can warm up to some of the harder ones that they set up wilds and things like that. This house believes that, oh I know, this house supports cooking, uh, mandatory cooking classes in high school. So that is our topic. 
we probably have to look at our like purposes of education and pick one. So we probably, if we're on the government bench, what type of school are we going to say should exist in society? Fantastic. So you want to make an argument that is kind of preemptive, because you know the other team's going to get up and say, you know, cooking, you don't really need it, and it's not really the job of the school to do that. You should probably learn that from your parents. So you want to preempt that and go, no, the role of school is to make you a fully functioning adult, to teach you those life skills and do that sort of thing. So we're firstly, we're going to name our principle, which is what school should teach life skills. Awesome. The second thing we do is we explain why it's important. Why do you think it's important that school teaches life skills? Even if it comes up the cost of academic results. In order to equip them for the future. Awesome. So kids need to exist in the future. They probably should be able to do basic tasks. Why else do we think it's important? Can any, does anybody know how to cook in this class? Would you guys be okay living on your own if you had to cook all your meals? Yes? No? No? Are you just going to eat instant noodles every day? Is that going to be bad for your life and health? Probably. So you want to say that these probably these life skills affect kids just as much as academic results do. So they're going to get up and say that academic results literally determine the course of your life and that they determine what university degree you get into and all that sort of thing. But you, you can make the same argument about life skills. If you can't do this basic task, your health suffers, you can't move out of home, for example, and you can't actually look after yourself. You can't engage in raising a family, for example. Those things that also make life important, even though they're not jobs and work, suffer too. So you want to say that your future is jeopardised, and you can't live a like healthy life might be one, and you can't live a health, healthy life, and you can't maybe raise a family or live on your own. Excellent. The third thing you do is draw an analogy. What's an analogy? Surely we've talked about analogies in your class, yeah? Can anybody think of one from the demo debate that was given? No? Do we know what analogies are at all? Base definition? Analysis? Kind of. It's a form of analysis. I think an analogy is saying that something is like something else. So, for example, if we say that if you're making an argument, if the topic is about that we should ban hate speech. You want to say that, or, uh, or for example, say that we want to um, criminalise a type of speech. You want to make a principled argument about why you can't just say whatever you want. So you want to say that freedom of speech is not absolute. This is important because speech can really harm people, makes life actively worse for them. If you defame them, they can't get a job, all that sort of thing. And then you want to draw an analogy. You want to say that, for example, we limit speech in other ways. We limit, you can't yell fire in a movie theatre, for example, that's illegal. Because everyone would have a stampede and people die. And that's bad. <laughs> so you want to say that when we, we actually criminalise speech when it hurts people. So a good example is actually for the topic that we would ban denying climate change. So you can't get up in public and say that climate change is fake. So you would say that we actually don't allow hate speech, for example, you to incite violence on others. We ban that. So what is another example when we sacrifice academics for teaching a life skill. Do you just have maths every day at school? Who's in high school still? Yeah, a lot of you. You guys probably just graduated from high school. Did you have maths every single day? All day? Yes? That was every single one of your classes in high school. Uh, no. no other subject. What? <laughs> so you can be like, for example, we teach sport and we teach things like art and drama and things like that, or teach things like PDHPE, which are which is um like health health classes and how to 
um, like have healthy relationships and live a healthy lifestyle, for example, as a class that we teach. That shows that we care about things other than just marks, even though we could have used that hour for tutoring. Make sense? And then we draw a link. We have to apply that analogy to this topic. So if we teach those things, why is that similar to teaching cooking? Perfect. So you would say that cooking is very similar to learning how to live at, um, to, for example, engage, uh, like, you know, there's sex ed in high school. You would say that cooking, for example, is similar to that in that sex ed isn't taught for academic benefit, it's taught to benefit your life. So cooking is very similar in that it benefits your life, but not your academics, but we still think that's valuable, so we would teach this too. See how you applied it? You can't just say that you do something else and everyone's like, cool. Like, all right. <laughs> Um, I think a really cool analogy is that if you're on the up bench and the topic is that we should ban animal testing and the app run this principle that is like, hurting animals is bad because it hurts them, what is your principle obviously going to be on the other side? Take away their rights? Uh, you're on the up bench. Hmm. You want to keep animal testing. You are on the animals are bad side. Who yeah. yeah. you're gonna run. Yeah, fantastic. You're gonna run a principle about human life is more important than animals. So you're gonna name the principle. Human life is more important than animals. I think this is important because animals are less sentient than humans. Humans have a greater concept of who they are. We should prioritize human benefit because animals are less beings. And you would see some reasons as to why that is true. So things like they're less intelligent. They can't. Um, they can't engage in like complex social interactions, for example. Humans have a fuller life, all that sort of thing. And then you would say an analogy is, what's another time that we hurt animals for human benefit? The meat industry exists. So the way you would apply that, um, the way that you would apply that analogy to that debate would be, the fact that we eat meat shows that we, if we care, we kill animals, we don't care. So surely if we test on them, that is probably principally similar and we're okay with that. Does that make sense? So you need to do that for these education debates too. Fantastic. So you apply it, say cooking is similar. And then lastly, so apply, oh, this is very messy, hey. Apply, link. Awesome. And then you link it to the topic. So because of that, that's why we think it fits what we think school should be. And often there will be a clash about what we think schools should be principally about. Does that make sense as one of the common principal arguments you would run? So if I give you, let's, let's do a more complex topic, yeah? Um, let me find my emotions. I'm just trying to be like, I know there's an, there's an education round in your tournament, so I'm going to be very cautious not to like say the topic because that would be quite bad. Um, if we said that, Um, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I knew it, I should have told you the topic, that's really bad. Yeah, but I didn't do it, so we should all be very careful. Okay, so say that we should say that we should ban, okay, just how old are you guys also? Is anybody younger than 15? Younger than 14? Younger than 13? Cool. <laughs> Probably don't want to do a complex um, sex ed topic, that was, I was thinking of setting. Um, <laughs> Okay, what about that we should, have you guys done streaming classes as a topic in class? Excellent. So, this house believes that we should stream classes. What do I mean by streaming classes? Live. Live. No. Good idea, but know what the topic's talking about. Streaming means splitting people on academic ability. So when you have a math class, you'll have a top math class and a bottom one, and you're graded based on your ability. That's a really common debate, actually, even in, like, university level because there is like genuine discussion about whether it's a good idea. So if I gave you a topic that we should stream classes, we're on the gov bench. Could you think about what principles we want to run? What do we think school should be about, fundamentally? Educating. Educating. What part of educating? Academics. Academics. So you want to run a really strong principle argument about why academics are the 100% the priority of schools, 
and all that other stuff about socialization, life skills, and feeling sad because you're in the bottom class or whatever is less important than focusing on your academics. That principle will become contingent on you proving that you get better academic outcomes. Because it makes sense that if you can't fulfill your principal goal of making academics better, then you probably lose the debate. But it's still a useful setup in case you get a class that is like, this enforces um, segregation amongst kids. It means they only mix with people of the same intelligence as them, and they think that children are dumber, for, like other kids are dumber or less valuable than them because they're in the lower class. So they might run an argument like that about why school should be principally about equality and making people more connected and things like that. So you want to jump on that first by being like, no, academics are the most important. So does that type of argument make sense? Fairly common. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, I, I didn't bring an eraser, so I'm just going to rub it out with paper because I'm an animal. <laughs> principle in education debate is often about parental versus government choice. So you will either be running a choice about why parents are the best actors to choose or why governments are the best actors to choose. Does that make sense? Because if you think about it, you're often banning stuff. So if you're banning some type of school, so the topic at, I think Austral a couple of years ago was that we would ban religious individuals from homeschooling their kids. So what side supports parental choice? Off bench thinks that religious parents should be able to do that. God bench thinks they shouldn't. God bench presumably thinks they shouldn't because the government is better at determining what's better for that child's welfare. Makes sense? So, we're going to run an argument. Parental choice. So, that is us naming our principles. Why do we think parental choice in education is important? And keep in mind that your alternative is government choice. So, you probably want to be justifying why parental choice is important in relation to the government. So you want to be saying, why are parents better than the government at choosing what types of schools exist, or what goes into the curriculum, or how they educate their children? So can you think of a few reasons why parents might be better than the government? Power will build kids better. They know their kids better. Why? Um, because they get access that more time for the kids. Fantastic. They live with them. So often you'll get an argument about banning selective schools. So presumably parents, you will say, parents know their kids pretty well. They will know if they can deal with the stress of going to a selective school. Otherwise, they wouldn't send them there. Make sense? What does the government know about this kid? Nothing. Why else? I reckon there's like four reasons why parents are better than government. Care about their kids more. Awesome. Presumably they love their children, so they probably want to make a good choice for them. Make sense? So if we're going on our banning selective schools topic, they're not going to put them in a school that is going to be bad for their kids because they want them to do well and they want them to be happy. In comparison to the government, which doesn't look at individuals, so doesn't know what's appropriate for in an individual just looks at things on a general level of like what is good for children, not what is good for this child. So they are primarily have the biggest stake in that kid's welfare, so they're probably going to do it the most. Have you made generic choice arguments before about why you should have individual choice? Yeah? So one of the reasons we say that we should give individuals more choice is because we have the biggest stake in, my, in your own welfare. So you asked the topic that we should legalise all drugs, for example. I would say that I have the biggest stake in my own welfare. I'm not going to make choices that are bad for me because the only person that feels that consequence is me. Make sense? It's a similar version of that. So parents have the biggest stake in their child's welfare. They're going to care the most about them and make the best choice. What else do you think? problems when something goes wrong. Why do you think that's true? Um, because 
uh, it is hard for government to uh, care every child in the state, but parents uh, only need to care his or his or her one child. Fantastic. So I think that's true, so they can make a more individual choice as opposed to a collective one. That means if that child has a special need, maybe that child is a more sporty child, would prefer to go to a more sports centred school or extremely academic, should be in a selective class, in a streamed class at the top. They're, like The government is probably going to use them for public good, but parents are going to be benefiting that child. I think also, parents have better information. Why do you think that is the case? As in the types of education that their kids should receive? Yeah. Yeah. So parents, because they have they love their kids, because they know their kids the best, they're going to do more research into the type of school that should exist and they're going to have special priorities. So the government is going to want things like cost efficiency, for example, and they're going to want things like a popular curriculum that will get them voted in next next like government. But the parents just want the best for their child, so they just want they want a more. They have a better set of priorities. They want things like a education system that doesn't have bullying, for example, because they want their child to be happy. So they're more likely to look at that type of information, whereas the government can't look at things like, is this school a happy school? Does that make sense? Because the government is going to look at numbers and data, whereas the parent is going to go to that school and say, is their teacher a exciting and engaging person that makes them passionate about learning, for example, or are they just like a school that beats them until they get good marks. And whereas the government will value that school that beats them until they get good marks, even if like all the students there are extremely depressed or are facing bullying and things like that, the government is very bad at picking that up because it's hard unless you go there. Awesome. And then I think also you want to say that parents, I think, you, I think you can do an even if argument here. So you say that this is true, this is true, this is true. Even if that wasn't the case, parents think it's true. And parents believe that they are entitled to look after their own children. So if you take that choice away, they get very upset. And that is important because it means that they, like you can make a practical argument here about how it puts them at odds with the state, particularly if they conservative, for example, or makes them less likely to do, engage in education services in the first place. Maybe they were home for their kids. So the reason that that's important is because, if, so for example, if you're in a religious school, what do you think is of priority to your parents? Religion. Yeah, religious education. Not just education, it's education through a religious lens. So if you can't believe that you're instructing your kids in your value system, that's probably really scary for you, right? It probably makes you feel like genuinely upset and it's really, really troubling. I think a really good example is often when couples divorce, everything might be okay for a little bit. And then one of the partners starts to marry somebody else. And then suddenly that other partner, as that kid is living with them for two days out of the week, becomes really angry because they're like, I don't know that other person. I don't know what they're teaching my child. I want to control what they learn. I want to instruct them in their value system. And that's when people get quite angry. That's why it's really important. Like, presumably your parents, too, think it's important to instruct you in a value system and have certain things, and they don't want, like, teachers telling them otherwise. So a good example of that is that often you get debates about should we teach abstinence only, at, like, should we ban abstinence only education, or should we ban creationism from being taught in school? And parents get upset often because that's at the core of their beliefs and they don't like people telling them how to raise their kids. Awesome. So you explain why it's important. Next thing is to draw an analogy. What are big choices we let parents do with their children? What do we give parents choice over? Their name. Name? What else? Pick their school. What else? What else do you pick? 
Did you pick your house? Did your parents sit down and go, what area would you like to live in, sweet child of two years old? <laughs> Probably not. So your parents can choose to raise you in a farm where there's nobody else around, or they can raise, raise you in the, a ghetto in the middle of the poorest city in the world, or they can raise you at the top of a skyscraper living in a mansion. The idea is, even if that environment is bad or dangerous or whatever, we still let parents choose that. We let parents choose what they feed their child. We let parents choose what religion they instruct them in, even if they, we think that religion is harmful. We let them make all these fundamental choices about how their child lives and what they do. Does that make sense? So it probably makes sense that we should let them have this choice about what school they go to or what they learn. See how that is applying that analogy? So we let them, uh, I forgot what I said, where you live, name, hobbies, religion. We would say that school is like these things. I don't know why I'm leaving letters out. And then you would link it. Conversely, if we are on the side that parents are bad and dumb and don't know anything about what's good for their children, we probably want to make an argument about why government knows best. So let's go to the idea that we should ban homeschooling. Why do we think the government is better at deciding what's best for children? Perhaps they have a set curriculum so that, because unlike homeschooling where the parents can like, they can choose what they want to teach their children. So, what's really good about the government setting the curriculum, for example? Is it just like me writing it out with no teaching, like with no teaching degree hanging out? I think maybe it is a salary to the general rule of the society. Fantastic. So one reason is, they have a macro view or broader view about what's good for kids. So they aren't caught up in the fact that they're, so often parents might be overprotective, for example, because they're so invested in their child's welfare, they don't let them do things like go out and socialize or go and do like dangerous sports or whatever. But the government isn't caught up in that like emotional game. They can make a very rational decision about what is best. What else? Can you say that parental choice is not something that the government choice? Because like parents will choose the school, like the uh, religion school, for of their own interest and uh, care less about the children's feelings. Um, fantastic. So you could say that the government is less selfish. So the government doesn't view children as being their property. They don't view them as having an entitlement to them. Whereas parents can often feel like that's my child. I like have property rights over it and I'm going to choose what I do with it. Make sense? So maybe that means that they will sacrifice, the government isn't trying to impose a value system for their own benefit, they just want to teach that they have a good society. What else? Can you think of like the flip of these things? Public schools have more of the teachers than the children. Like children in the wrapping skills, which we, we, we cannot know from, understand from home school. Fantastic. So I think you can say that would come into that more macro view or less selfish view of education. The government can see broadly that social skills are necessary in a way that parents might not. So if a parent has never been to university, they might not think it's important. Whereas a school system with a government knows that that type of stuff is important. Does that make sense? So similarly with like, um, similarly with um, social skills. What about information? What do governments have that parents don't? Resources. Excellent. So if they want to write up a new curriculum, if they want to find the best method of teaching children, is it, um, is it having a flipped classroom where the children go home and watch lectures every night and then come into class and talk about them, or is it the other way around? Do we have laptops? Do we have not? That sort of thing. They can do things like run whole studies. They can talk to experts. They can hire the top teachers in the field to write that stuff for them. Parents just have themselves. Make sense? I think the other thing is that they are long-term. So parents might be caught up 
They're like, oh, my child looks stressed. Maybe I should not give them as much work, that sort of thing. Whereas the government is more likely to look more, more long term and say, look, they need to be stressed now so that they can deal with it in the future. Because they are more emotional, that sort of thing. Excellent. What is an analogy of when the government stops parents doing whatever they want with their kids? Is it true that you can just do whatever you want with your kids? Fantastic. What happens when parents abuse their children? Uh, the government thinks you need Yeah. How do they, what do they do there? Um, punish the parents. What do they do with them there? What, they, what happens to the kids? Taken away. Fantastic. So we actually say if you hurt your child, we will take that child from you. That probably shows that you don't own that child. You can't just do whatever you want with them. So in the case of abuse, we actually take your child away. Can we apply that analogy somehow? Why is, like, for example, the principle underlying why we take children away in the case of abuse, like supporting government choice? So why are we taking that child away? The government knows what's better for the child. And even if the parent truly believes that beating their child is the best way to teach them, do we let them do it? Yeah. No. So we say that in instances where parents don't know best, where parents harm their child, okay. we actually take that child away. So we could say that, for example, if you homeschool your child or you religiously indoctrinate them with values that are bad or like teach them things that evolution isn't real, or that sex education is something that you don't need, that actually hurts your child in the long term, right? So we should probably do the same and take that choice away by banning that school, by stopping them doing that thing. Make sense? Excellent. Then we just do our nice link there for we should prioritise government choice in this instance. Awesome. So people ran these arguments, um, if you remember, in the very first demo debate on banning single-sex schools. So I think we ran that in extension about why parents are very like why parents deserve to have that choice, particularly if they're religious, things like that. And once you complicate it more with using more specific stakeholders like religious parents or parents from a rural background or parents in developing countries, they are going to have slightly different incentives and ways of anal analyzing these four things. So, for example, if they love their kids or uh, if, they, um, uh, if they genuinely believe that they know their kids the best, it might be that educating them in a value system is of number one importance for that child to fit into that community. So if they don't have a religious education, they won't know what, how their community runs or understands it. Make sense? Excellent. So I think those are the main principles to run from education based. So, have a think about what the topic is asking you to do. Are you taking something away from parents? Are you giving it to them? Are you giving more power to the government? Are you not? Are you changing what school is fundamentally about? And then justify why that should be the case, or why we should care about other things. Awesome. I'm going to put the PowerPoint back up. Any questions about that? Have you guys done any education topics in your class that you found challenging or didn't know how to rebut or argue? No? Fantastic. I'm just waiting for this to come down. Okay. The first topic area I want to talk about is about school curriculum. So often there is a talk about the main kind of questions that underlie those debates. So when you see WIP speakers giving questions at the end of the debate, like, why um, is this a just policy? 
or does this lead to better outcomes? Is this better for our economy? You know how they have those three questions that wrap up the debate and like form the framework for their rebuttal. And similarly, you'll see adjudicators do that too. With other oh, three key questions in this debate, I believe OG answered it best for these reasons, or OO did, or whatever. So I think the key questions in curriculum debates are often who is best at determining what children learn? Is it teachers? Is it parents? Is it the government? Is it somebody else? That sort of thing. Is it a religious leader, for example? I think the other thing that is underlying those questions is what should children be learning? Is that a very fundamental question? And what is the best way to teach them that subject? So, uh, oh. excellent. So, this house believes that we should give controlled education, curriculum, administration, and policy, for example, teacher pay and curriculum, to teachers' unions. Does anybody know anything about teachers' unions? What is a teachers' union? Even bigger, what is a union? Unions are really big in Western countries. Protect so people who like uh, protect the rights of teachers. Fantastic. So it's a group of teachers that talk with the government or talk with schools to change things like the minimum wage for teachers or teachers' conditions. You will have workers' unions that will do the same for different industries. So, for example, like um, the manufacturing unit union might say that pay is too low, we need to raise it. Or these conditions are bad, our workers are dying of lung cancer, you need to give us uh, safety marks or something like that. They lobby for those kind of, um, or like we need more holiday pay because people are stressed, that sort of thing. Why doesn't their boss just turn around and say no? What, how does unions get what they want? Right. Perfect. So, if teachers go, we need more pay, or we w are working too long with no resources, and the government goes, that's cute, go home, or like go to school and teach, then one day no teachers come to class. Very effective way of getting what you want, yeah? The idea is that they strike a bargain to stop them going on strike. Um, because teachers are so important, those strikes are really big and have a lot of impact. Um, as a side note, a really common debate you can get is that we would stop emergency services from striking, you know, like police and ambulances and doctors. And the question is, is that, is that can they campaign for their rights or is their role in society so important that they're not there for a day? <laughs> That's horrible. Um, but yeah, so if we're going to give curriculum to teachers' unions, why would that be a, why do you think teachers' unions are useful? What do you think they're good at doing? I actually think it's important, firstly, sorry, to break down the stakeholder of teachers into different countries because I think they're very different. So, teachers in Australia, not all of them, but it's very easy to be a teacher in Australia. So, often you'll get people that are like, I really want to be a lawyer. So, they study in school or whatever, they get a really bad marks, and they go, oh, well, I'll do teaching. Because it's really easy to get into. Like, one of the lower classes to get into. In the Netherlands, though, you guys have met Dan? He's actually a teacher. You have to be a postgrad student to be a teacher in the Netherlands. Very, very different. So he's highly intelligent and it's a very well respected profession. So I think same in India, if you're a teacher, that is one of the most high respected jobs, up there with lawyer and doctor, for example. But in countries like Australia and I think to an extent the UK and America, often you just do it and it is not one of the most respected jobs. And what it and that means that if it's not well respected, what tends to happen? Why do people want to be doctors and lawyers? You get respected. You get respected and you get, high pay. you get a high pay. People like, even if I don't like it, I'll just like coast with and cry in my Ferrari or whatever. Like, life's not that bad. But if you're a teacher and you're not respected in your society, what do you think you're getting? Lower pay. Lower pay. So teaching isn't a super well-paid profession in Australia. Obviously, some teachers are on a lot of money, but you have to be at the very top. Your average teacher is there. Um, same in the UK. Different in the Netherlands. You're paid very well because society respects you. Things like that. So often that will be a level of analysis that might be necessary. So if you're running an extension on teachers in the developed world and teachers in the developing world, that can often change incentives or if the motion is specific to often America because they do weird things with their schools, like really weird things with their schools, that can be important to note as well. So why do you think teachers unions are good? Why would we support them? Uh, 
so they know children really well. That probably means that if they're setting a curriculum, they're going to be knowing what's going to be easy to teach, what kids are going to like and find interesting, for example, and what they're going to want to learn. What else do they know really well? How to teach kids. Fantastic, they're really good at teaching because it's a job. <laughs> so, presumably they will set good things because they know how to teach and that is a good thing too. Why else would we respect, like, teachers unions? Why are they good? Because I don't think this motion works in the context of the Netherlands, for example. You don't need a union in the Netherlands if you are one of the top paid professions. Does that make sense? But you're probably talking about teachers that are less respected. Why do you think they need a union? Because they want to protect their own rights. Fantastic. Why do you think their rights are often hard to get? As an individual, like you, your life is like somehow damaged or abandoned. Like the government do not really care about you because they can find another one to pick your place. Fantastic. So maybe it's because teaching is really easy to get into in these countries. That means there's always an oversupply. So if you're not happy, you can leave. Somebody else will come in. Why else is it hard for them to protect their rights? What kind of things, what kind of rights do you think teachers ask for? So if it's construction workers want hard hats and big boots, for example, what do you think teachers want? A good Rough. teaching environment. A good teaching environment. What, is, what does that mean? So equipped with resources that can help their teaching. Fantastic. So they want resources. What else do they want? If you were a teacher, what would you ask for? Think selfishly, what would you want? Right. Yeah, you want bigger pay, what else do you want? How do you respect? You'd probably call government for that though. The government would be like, um, yeah, yeah, sure, I, I respect you. I think you want holidays. I think you want sick leave. I think you want an attention. You want all that stuff that unions usually campaign for. Yeah? Cool. So, that might, these might be reasons why. So one reason that their rights are often under assault is that parents often ask to get them fired because they're like, my kids are doing badly. And the kids are like, well, your, your kid's dumb. Or your kid doesn't do any work. Um, and your kid never hands in homework, for example. So no wonder he's failing his class. And then the teacher is often blamed for that failure of that student. So that often makes them quite vulnerable in their work environment. In the same way that an office worker is probably never really blamed for anything that goes wrong in that company. Another, uh, yeah, and another reason is there's just a general like, lack of respect often. Which means that often things like wage, they don't, people don't feel like they deserve a high wage. Or they don't deserve any of these traits, like conditions, things like that. So this is particularly true of teachers in America, and teachers in poor schools. So you have teachers having to pay out of their own salary to fix windows in their class and repaint walls that were full of mould and clean them themselves. And that's probably unfair and a terrible way to run a classroom. The teachers feel like they have to do that. Make sense? The other reason that you might say that you need a union is that their work is hard and their work is important. So you say that teaching kids is challenging, particularly teaching difficult kids. I've had a kid throw a chair at me before because it was like I was teaching in a more rougher classroom in Australia. So, this is like genuinely quite difficult often. They're not as quiet as you often in Australia. Um, and also, if you, don't te if you teach badly, you like lose a whole generation that don't get to learn properly, that probably don't get into university, don't have that high level of education, and don't do all those things that are very good for the government. And they perform the public good. So if you are educated, you're automatically less likely to commit a crime. Things like that. Fantastic. Why do you think teachers' unions are bad? Why would they be bad at setting curriculum? Do we know what the curriculum is? What are we putting in the curriculum? What the teachers are supposed to teach. Fantastic. So what subject? If we're going to teach history, they determine what parts the teacher to teach. So that's quite important. If you're teaching English, they teach what books you learn. So it's even more broader than that. 
determine things like how many hours of learning should be in the curriculum. So why do the teachers in this actually be quite bad at that? They're biased. They're biased. They're really self-interested. So who do you think they're going to care about the most? Teachers. So what do you think they're going to get lobby for? More than they actually need. Yeah. So what kind of changes in the curriculum would they make? <coughs> Fewer lessons. Fewer lessons. Maybe they want to go home early. <laughs> what else? More holidays. More holidays. Higher pay. Well, yeah, that probably won't come into curriculum so much. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's on there. Administration and policy, so teacher pay, things like that, yeah. Curricula. I think also they would lobby for things like even the way things are taught to be maybe easier. So maybe they will lobby for subjects to have less interaction, so they have less marking, things like that, which is hate marking. Awesome. And you would say that they are, yeah, more self-interested, whereas the government, if you are saying that your counter-proposal would be that the government determines the curriculum, can do things like consult teachers and say, what do you think is good, but at the end of the day, can take into account other people, like talking to parents and talking to children. And that provides a more balanced perspective on how much that thing should be or what we should learn. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think often teachers are like quite snooty in some ways. So have you, like your English teachers tend to be like quite pretentious, I find. They're like Shakespeare or nothing. Or like the Bai or nothing if you're doing Chinese poetry and things like that. They just think that they should teach the great works because often they are English majors in, in, in university and they write their thesis on fancy like literature and things like that and they think that that stuff is the most important. Where the state might be, actually, we are in the context of a post-colonial country or a country that used to be ruled by England or something like that. Maybe we should be, instead of teaching English authors, be focusing on local authors, even if they are of relatively lower quality, for example, or they aren't as like high art. That is often a question, as you can, uh, I think, in this one, is that post-colonial states, like India and like regions in Africa, for example, should look at local literature. Whereas a teacher might be more likely to say, like, no, that's not learning, that's not a real book, whatever. They're not using enough metaphors. And then that sort of thing. So you could say that maybe a state could take into other things like that. So things like when we're looking at social cohesion as being one of the things, or national identity as being something important to teach in the school, they might care about that more than a school teacher might. So that could actually be a really interesting extension, I think, that you would say that teachers wouldn't care about that, whereas the government might. Does that make sense? So most of education debates are just analyzing incentives. Fantastic. I think also the big split in what do we teach our kids is do we place a bigger emphasis on national science or do we care about things like humanities and art? So why do you think that learning stuff like math and science is more important than humanities and art? They're more analytical. Why is that good? Because uh, to educate requires students to think on their own instead of only appreciating like patient part. Yeah. Fantastic. You might say it teaches a better way of thinking. Well. If I was like, oh, I want to change my degree, and then oh, I think I might change my degree. I'm, I'm studying law at the moment, so I'm like, oh, I'm doing law right now, but I think I might want to do philosophy. What would be the advice you would give me? So you would say that math and science and hard subjects like that are very easy to find jobs in very natural for you to like, then you can go work as an engineer, or you can go be a software person, you can work in IT, there's like millions and millions of jobs in that. Whereas if you're like, I just read books and I really like art, there's not a lot you can really do. So maybe there's less practical and less important in that way. So maybe a government, for example, might be so focused on practical subjects that they forget to include other ones. Why do you think learning liberal arts and learning philosophy and learning humanities subjects are important? They encourage people to have knowledge about other things, not just 
or just knowledge about the world in general. Fantastic. So they might teach us broader general knowledge. So things like history, for example, are really important. So they teach us about how our country came to be, what values we should have, and what lessons from the past should we remember. So often people draw parallels between the rise of populism now and the rise of Nazi Germany. So very similar symptoms. And you can't know that unless you study history. What else? Why is it even like, like, does anybody study liberal arts or like that the most as their favourite subject? No? What do we all study? Who's in uni? Hands up my uni students. No one's in uni here. Yeah, what do you, what's your degree? Uh, uh, I study business and English. Business and English. English as in English literature or English as in English language? Uh, English language, I guess. Okay, awesome. I, I study um, law and art, but art just means I study, I do double major, one in Chinese studies, which is yeah. learning Chinese, and one in um, international relations. So, the reason that you picked up, presumably, is because you want to work in business and maybe travel overseas, so it's important to know English, that sort of stuff. But I really wish I kind of picked a few units that were more to do in literature and all that sort of stuff, because I also chewed out in English literature and I really love that stuff too. I think the reason that that stuff is important is because it teaches you how to think in a very creative way, and often that's really important in the workforce. So one of the most popular degrees at the moment in Australia is a Bachelor of Creative Intelligence. It doesn't teach you anything specific, it doesn't feel like just now you are an engineer, it just teaches you how to think creatively and think outside the box. And often banks love that stuff, software people love that stuff because they're looking for a new business or a new marketing idea and things like that, and they really love that sort of thing. I think also it teaches you morals. So if you study something like philosophy, it really makes you think about the world and how to be an ethical person. And that can be something that is just as important as being an intelligent person. So often there are very smart people who are terrible. Just like terrible, terrible people. Often the smarter they get, the more terrible they get as people. And are more likely to do things like, for example, crash the entire financial system for the sake of earning some money. So you say, maybe if they study philosophy in high school, oh, Maybe if they study philosophy in high school, maybe if they've done an ethics class in high school, they might not have done that. Does that make sense? So you could say that maybe teachers value skills like debate, value skills like learning creatively, whereas governments are just going to look at numbers and statistics and be like, well, what jobs do we need now? We probably need some more engineers. We'll just teach them more engineering. Does that make sense? See how this debate works now? It's a pretty basic stuff. You're just analysing incentives for different people. What about the bottom one? That's a bit different. That we regret, or this house regrets, the depiction of protagonists in children's books and media as being aesthetically superior. What does that topic mean? I don't know. What's aesthetic? Aesthetically just means appearance. So, the hero in every story, in every Disney news movie. The princess, is she ugly? No. So the but is the villain ugly? Yeah, so Ursula in The Little Mermaid is like fat and scary and like wears really grotesque makeup. Whereas Ariel say like, I'm a mermaid and I'm beautiful and I hang out. <laughs> Make sense? So why do you think that we want to regret that? And how can we link that to some of our principles about education? Note that you probably wouldn't be making an argument about specifically the government or specifically the education system, but rather just general arguments about what we should be teaching our kids and what values we care about. some sort of influence yeah. on children. Why would it influence them? I think it's kind of related to stereotypes. Fantastic. Why do you think it's a bad stereotype that good people are beautiful and bad people are ugly? Like, uh, in a reality, it's not necessarily good people. Like, uh, like it's looking like people can be evil. Yes, 100%. Often they're evil because they are good looking. <laughs> so do you guys remember the mean girls in your high school? They were probably very beautiful and could get lots of boyfriends and were very popular and were happy to bully everybody because they knew that they were pretty and were in charge. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. So you would say that it might be bad because it 
makes people think that good looking people can do whatever they want. Good you know good looking people are automatically treated better in society. So there's this thing called the halo effect, whereas if a good looking person is a accused of a crime, the jury will automatically assume that they are innocent or more likely to be innocent. Partially because of this. Because when they were kids, all the good looking people were innocent and taught to be pure and good and lovely. Make sense? In for men, in terms of height per centimetre, some study worked out how much money you lose per centimetre depends on your depends on your height. Compared it's like you like you lose like two thousand dollars per inch or something. It's like insane. <laughs> two thousand Australian, like US dollars per centimetre, not like Hong Kong dollars. So you could say that this actually like really negatively affects people. It might also impact how children see themselves, for example. So if you aren't to look like the like, Disney princess, if you don't look like the most beautiful ideal, you might think that you're a bad person. That sort of thing. And that's why that people often think of like are quite harsh towards fat people. They think that they're lazy and they attribute bad moral qualities to them. Even though nothing about that body should suggest the fact of, of those things. Because often skinny people are super lazy. Yeah? Doesn't mean that you necessarily work out all the time. It just means that you have a fast metabolism and you're just born like that, yeah? Like, I know a lot of people who go to my gym that wouldn't look like that they necessarily go to the gym every day, but I know that they do. Make sense? Easy. You think you can understand that debate? Yeah. Should we be correcting some things? Make sense? Okay, this is a practice topic. This helps support the teaching of inaccurate historical narratives in schools where they promote useful social or moral norms. Any words we don't understand in that topic? Could you think of an example of an inaccurate thing that they often teach in school? Or a more propaganda thing they teach in school? I think a really common one is America. So they often teach that the founding fathers were not like were cared about liberating slaves, for example. But the reality was like Alexander Hamilton was a slave owner himself. And so often they just leave that out because he stood for things like more rights for immigra immigrants and things like that. Like he had broader social good, but often don't teach the fact that he was a slave owner and so some was quite racist in his time. So if I split the class up and choose and got four and four, so that's really easy, we'll do government bench and opposition bench. So if you guys can get into a circle and come up with two or three arguments, that would be really good. Mm -hmm. You have to move and turn around before we try to introduce ourselves. Uh, our own no, we're Just let me know if this lecture is too hard or too easy, too fast or too slow. I will adjust accordingly. It's going to be very hard to write things down if we're not talking and we don't have a pen in our hands. What time does the session finish?